Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. This show is brought to you in partnership with the Happy Confident Company, who provide clinically approved, ready to go wellbeing and mental health programs to help your pupils thrive in only 10 minutes a day. Visit www.happyconfident.com to find out more. Enjoy the podcast. This programme has been brought to you by the Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready to go, wellbeing and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and wellbeing tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. But you've got me, Lucy Newberger, and uh, a couple of actually three guests this evening to talk about uh, modern foreign languages in primary school. Uh, So that's going to be very exciting. There's going to be quite a few people dipping in and out, which is lovely. I can already see uh, Lisa's uh, in there and ready to go. And I can also see Anna is in there ready to go. Oh, and Alex has just popped in as well. So all three are here. So we'll get uh, all three on in in due course. I'm sure they're going to have plenty to to say on this. Um, And... I'm quite excited because I think that uh, it's one of the subjects that I've yet to cover on my primary subject journey. And it seems to be one that many forget about and one that actually I uh, almost forgot about before I remembered. No, actually, this does need to be talked about as well. So before we get stuck into our primary modern foreign languages journey and chat, I'm going to do my usual and I know some of you love it, some of you don't love it, but I'm going to give you my my weekly update or a uh, two weekly update as it is now because I'm I'm on every other week these days, um, which is which is lovely because uh, it gives me time to collect more weird and wonderful stories. I should start by saying that uh, at the weekend I was very fortunate to be in Rome at Research Ed Italia where I had a lovely lovely time and uh, met lots of fascinating people, including I ran into, and this is going to blow your minds, I ran into my GCSE English teacher. And I was sort of, I was kind of hard staring at this at this woman. And uh, I thought, it can't be her, can't, can't be her, can't be like, this is ridiculous. I'm in, I'm in Rome. I'm at, a, I'm at this event that cannot be my GCSE English teacher. No, lo and behold, it it was, and uh, I stopped her at lunchtime, and I said, "You know, this is going to this is going to sound absolutely mad, but I'm pretty sure you taught me at a uh, we were kind of grammar school in the in the uh, UK in about 2005." And she said, "Yeah, yeah, that 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 would have been would have been me." Um, so that was that was quite nice, and I went to some wonderful sessions, which I won't bore you with the details of now, but met some fantastic people, had my brain scratched, and that was absolutely delightful. So lots of things to to think about and uh, I may or may not have inadvertently agreed to then uh, go and speak in uh, in Dusseldorf at the German version uh, of research ed in 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 August so I may I may live to regret that I may not I don't know I don't know how I feel about that one yet particularly as I haven't decided on a topic to to speak about but more on that another time Um, I know most of you are on half term at the moment. So if you are joining me, thank you very much. I am enormously grateful. I can see a few bods popping, popping in, which is, which is lovely. So I hope you're having a great time. I'm not on half term because I live and work in in an international school in Portugal, for those of you who don't know. And uh, we may not get the May half term or May, June half term, but we finish on the 30th of June so can't really complain and uh, I know some of you are probably cursing me for that but it is one of the perks I suppose of of being out here in a in an international school but uh, I wish you all those of you that are on half term I hope you're having a lovely time I hope you're relaxing not doing any work although it is the time of year where we're doing those final sets of reports and actually I was looking back on previous shows I've done last this round this time last year I was talking about reports and parents evenings and how many you think um, how many people think are appropriate how many we should be churning out each year the difference kind of between primary and secondary and I can't actually really remember what the consensus was I think in an ideal world the 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 written report would uh 
would die a death. Uh, and I think um, certainly uh, in chats I've had recently, I think people would rather do maybe an additional parent seeming rather than having to write out uh, the same thing in different ways numerous, numerous times. I also confessed yesterday that I have in the past made that mistake where I have copied and pasted a comment I have used previously and left in the wrong name. And the worst part of that was it wasn't even named close to the child in question. It was so far, like they started with different letters. They sounded completely different. And how this managed to end up uh, in front of a parent is something I will never live down. So if you are in the throes of report writing and you are tempted to copy and paste, for goodness sake, proofread people or get somebody who is so far removed from it to proofread for you uh, because mistakes do happen and it can be very embarrassing so don't be like me um anything else in the realms of uh, my lovely year fives uh nothing nothing spectacular at the moment although um in terms of terrible teacher points i did start to hold their end of year camp over their heads in terms of behavior now i know this is a terrible thing to do but it kind of gets to the point where you will almost do anything to make them behave at this, or at least attempt to try and make them behave at this time of year so judge me as you see fit but when you've got certain children who come into their class come into your classroom and then decide to roll on the floor to get to their seat or you have to ask to sit down five times in quite a loud voice in quite a short space of time for one of them to stop staring at the map on your wall which fascinating though it is and i love having a map on the wall and i fully endorse that um there's a time and a place to be staring at it without listening to your teacher. But uh, they're, they're clinging on. Um, although I did send, I think I sent five children home yesterday with various illnesses, which seems excessive. But I'm also at the point where, you know, if they turn green, I'm just I'm just sending them home. I'm not risking it because at the end of the day, if I get sick, they don't have a teacher. And we're also at the point in the year where people are burning out. They are getting tired. They are getting sick and you know having to cover for other staff is I mean I don't I don't begrudge it it happens but it also means that I ran out of time to do the million and one other things I'm meant to be doing like writing reports and I haven't even started yet I probably shouldn't confess that out loud but no I haven't started um I am that person who doesn't get the fear until quite late and I kind of wish my fear would kick in sooner um because the deadline is rapidly approaching and yet I, I don't know if I just don't have the energy to have the fear or whether it's just it's just going to creep up on me at some point. But we are we are getting dangerously close to that. Um, and it's just. I remember saying before, I love summer term, I do, because it's kind of lots of fun stuff, but just the next few weeks at school in terms of trips we're trying to pull off, sports days, talent shows. Uh, we've got a kind of wear animal print day slash children's day on Thursday. There is so much happening, which I love and is absolutely great. But in terms of trying to keep some semblance of order in classes, gosh, it's it's hard because I am that person that has learned. I used to be that teacher that kind of would, you know, the last sort of week, couple of weeks, I'd be kind of quite chill. I'd be like, as, as a newer teacher, you know, maybe I just need to kind of just just let it go a bit. And chaos reigned. And so I am that person that now tries to cling on to some sense of routine for as long as possible. But when you have all these events, uh, lovely as they are, it just creates chaos. And it's the difficulty, I think, is that I don't want to get rid of these events because, you know, what kind of horrible person would want to get rid of, you know, your, your sports days and your and your lovely events. But it's just... I don't know, maybe it's just the tiredness creeping in, meaning that behaviour management is perhaps not as strong as it would normally be. So, uh, yes, we are, we are where we are with all of these uh, all of these different things. Anyway, I'm going to stop prattling on about, about all of that and actually get down to the, the nitty gritty of what this evening is about. Now, I've got three people who are very keen to speak to me this evening. So I think first things first, we need to get them all in and uh, introduced and uh, introduced to to you as listeners to me and to each other and uh, we've got teachers and people working in all kinds of different walks of life which I think is going to make this a very interesting conversation I've loved all my subject chats that I've done so far and we really have gone through the spectrum we've gone we've done maths 
we've done writing, reading, we've done history, geography, we've done computing, science, art, PE, and we've now arrived at modern foreign languages, which, as I said, I very embarrassingly nearly forgot about, which working in a school where, you know, many languages are spoken and a primary school at that seems almost unforgivable. So I'm hoping that my guests this evening will forgive me. But let's get them on. I can see two are already ready to speak, but Alex, you need to accept your speaker invite for me. So we have got Anna. Anna, can you hear me? Hello, yes, I can. So first of all, I'm going to get you to introduce yourself and your current role in education, please. Okay, um, my name's Anna Granger and I work in a, um, a primary school in quite a deprived area of Coventry. Um, I was secondary trained, I taught secondary for a while um, and I moved into primary about um, nine years ago when it first became compulsory in primary schools um, and I've really developed a real passion for, for early language teaching and learning, um, so that's me. Lovely, thank you, Anna. Lisa, are you there? Can you hear me? I can indeed hear you, yes. I've just realised I have to sit still, otherwise the Wi-Fi keeps going. Okay, yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> it's, uh, we do um, live on the edge with, uh, with the tech in some of these shows, but just stick with it, do the best you can. You are coming through loud and clear at the moment, though. That's great. I'm not at home at the moment. I'm in an Airbnb in Copenhagen, so I'm not entirely sure where the Wi-Fi cold spots are. So, um, yeah, nice to uh, join you this evening. Uh, my name's Lisa Stevens. I teach uh, primary Spanish in two primary schools in the Birmingham area. Um, like Anna, I started out in secondary. I was uh, head of department, uh, but my heart had always been to be a middle school teacher. Um, it was something I couldn't do when I trained. I mean, I'd be able to do it now, but I'm very old. And at that point, I couldn't do it. So I had to go into secondary. Um, but I just, in the end, I just followed my heart, um, handed in my resignation and got a job teaching in a prep school uh, almost immediately after that. And then grew uh, my role in primary uh, till I got a job at one of the schools I teach at now. Um, and then, yeah, I've been doing that for 17, 18 years now and Apart from two years when we lived in Switzerland with my husband's job, um, haven't looked back. Uh, it's been wonderful. Fabulous. Well, lovely to have you both. I know that uh, Alex is trying to join us. So, Admin, if you could just give me a hand getting him um, on board, that would be super. Oh, I just said on board. That sounds very corporate, doesn't it? But, uh, yeah, I can just see thumbs up there. Thank you. So we will crack on and hopefully Alex will uh, join the party momentarily. Now, I start most of these shows by looking at the national curriculum for England. The reason being is because that's what I have taught, um, both in the UK and abroad. And I appreciate that, um, and Alex actually mentioned to me when I spoke to him earlier today, that he doesn't uh, use English curriculum, and I appreciate that a lot of people don't. However, um, and interestingly, I had this conversation with the Portuguese teachers at my school recently because they follow um, or they kind of devise their own sort of curriculum. Um, but they've been told to kind of refer to <laughs> sounds almost sounds ridiculous. They've been told to refer to the English curriculum because that's as a school what we teach. But in large part, what they do already is already covered by this. And one of the reasons I use it is because it's kind of a, a jumping off point that we can use to sort of understand where we're at in terms of language teaching in primary schools and you know whether it does actually include what we need and what we can do to well improve so these uh, I should warn my guests in advance that these shows do go off on all sorts of tangents so while we start at one point there'll be other things that come up along the way um, it is always a bit of a, a sort of rabbit hole that we end up going down but we um 
we'll see where we get to really but we want to i mean i uh i was going to see if i could go through this entire show without mentioning brexit and its effect on on language teaching but i am going to go there just to warn um just also letting tom rogers know so he can you know mentally prepare himself do some deep breathing just in case um so i'm going to start by reading you this purpose of study from the english national curriculum and Lisa and Anna, I just want to kind of get your your thoughts on this in terms of a basis for modern foreign language teaching in primary school. So here we go. Learning a foreign language is a liberation from insularity and provides an opening to other cultures. A high quality languages education should foster pupils curiosity and deepen their understanding of the world. The teaching should enable pupils to express their ideas and thoughts in another language and to understand and respond to its speakers, both in speech and writing. It should also provide opportunities for them to communicate for practical purposes, learn a new way of thinking and read great literature in the original language. Language teaching should provide the foundation for learning further languages, equipping pupils to study and work in other countries. So this is key stage two only, I should say, at the moment. Um, And I'm sure both Anna and Lisa are going to have some thoughts on this. So whichever one of you wants to jump in first, please, please do share your, your thoughts on that. It's going to be a race if you unmute first here. Lisa's Hi. first in. <laughs> it's, it's Lisa. Um, I actually think that bit refers to both Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3. That first preamble is the preamble to Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3. So I don't think they're expecting in year, in kind of the key stage two learners and necessarily be reading great works of literature although i consider the hungry caterpillar to be a great work of literature absolutely (laughs) so i think that is um and i think there are poems that they could that they can read that are great works of literature i mean my children read uh, gloria fuertes poems and she writes brilliant poems um so i think a lot of what is said in that is absolutely spot on the idea of curiosity of opening children's minds and horizons to things beyond their own experience, um, to uh, being the foundation for further language learning. I very much see Key Stage 2 as building those foundations that are built on throughout their their language learning career. And I hope that Key Stage 2 is not the end of their language learning. Um, Mm. I always, as I send them off to secondary school, I'm always hopeful uh, that they are going to carry on with their language learning in, in whatever form that will take, with whichever language they're going to be learning. I'll let Anna have a word now. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I completely agree with Lisa. Um, and I think as well, you know, it's really important that they do start at an earlier age. I always think it's it's too late almost by the time they're 11. I mean, admittedly, I only started to learn languages at the age of 11. Um, I'm guessing Lisa probably did as well. She's about my sort of age. Um I actually started at oh, seven. Oh, sorry, Lisa. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. I was I was the tail. I'm older than you. I was the tail end of the Nuffield project, uh-huh. and my school actually taught it for four years. So I'd learnt four years of French by the time I got to uh, secondary school, and I was absolutely fed up at secondary school. That I had to start again. But that's another issue. Yeah. I'm shutting up. Yeah, that that is actually a a big issue that, you know, there are some schools who are doing um, quite a bit of language. There's some schools that are doing nothing um, still, even though it's meant to be compulsory. Um, And so the the problem, you know, with with transitioning to Key Stage 3 is that teachers are taking them in year seven and sometimes they've got some language, some children haven't got some language. And and I've always been really mindful that I don't want my children to sort of feel like they've got to repeat everything when they get into year seven that they've already done in, in Key Stage 2. Um, but going back to... Um, what you were you were saying Lucy about what's on the the national curriculum um I think yeah it's really important we've got to open those minds at a younger age and you know we've seen obviously you you mentioned the Brexit word first not me but um you know we we've seen we see so much xenophobia over here and and I just think that if we really start to introduce those children to other cultures and language learning from a younger age that that can really start to um what's the word start to um sort of you know change those mindsets whereas they've got a little bit fixed by the time they get to secondary school does that make sense 
Oh, absolutely. And I, uh, I completely get behind what, what you're saying in, in that respect. Now, we, I mean, I'm looking at key stage, key stage two. And of course, a lot of this starts in key stage two. I remember, I remember doing a bit of French at primary school. I can still remember the song about chicken. So when we're talking about great literature, I mean, I suppose do songs, I suppose songs do count as a uh, literature of some sorts, but uh, yeah. They I do. Still, songs yeah. and rhymes definitely count. I, I mean, and the fact that, you know, we're talking 25 years later, I could, and I'm not going to sing it, but I probably could, uh, word for word, says something, I guess, about, um, I mean, the rest of my French leaves a little to be desired, but I can, yes, sing you a delightful song about chickens. Anyway, I digress already. So we're talking about starting in Key Stage 2. Now, obviously, in Key Stage 1 and in early years, there's um, there's phonics, there's language understanding going on, you know, language development going on. In, in English but is it too early to also be introducing um other other languages do you think is it maybe too confusing for children that are younger or do you think there is a place for uh languages starting even lower down the school I don't think it's too early at all uh I, I as I said I teach in two schools in one of the schools I teach in uh we start an introduction to Spanish when they're in nursery um, and they sing Spanish songs, um, not just Spanish, they, they investigate different languages. They actually investigate their own languages, the languages that are spoken within that class. Um, and that's something that I've really built on over the years I've been there, is that, that uh, it's really important to me and really important now to the school um, that the languages children speak at home are celebrated and we call, we call them their superpowers and that it's something to be proud of. When I first started teaching that, it was something children would hide. They wouldn't want people to know that they didn't speak English at home. And now we have children that want to share it all the time. Um, and we have assemblies in which they share their own languages, um, in which children who don't speak another language at home desperately want to share a language they've learned or, or a little song they've learned or a poem that they've learned. Um, and that starts as little as, as, as nursery and reception. They carry on in year one and two. They don't do it um, as part, as a lesson within the curriculum, but they do it within uh, their assembly time. They have, uh, I have a wonderful colleague who was actually one of my pupils. I feel so old, um, who now uh, works at, at our school and he takes an assembly once every half term with the children and, and, and teaches them something and then they ca carry on in class and teach their teach their teachers um but no I don't think that's too early at all not at all oh that's, that's a that's a, a lovely a lovely thing to share and Anna I don't know uh, what your thoughts are on, on maybe starting lower down than key stage two yeah same as Lisa um when I first started at my school I did used to teach in Spanish in nursery um unfortunately uh, partly because I went part-time um a few years ago um and also because they told me the early years curriculum was so packed. Um, I don't do it that far down anymore. I do start in year two and um, and they're so enthusiastic in year two. They, you know, we do lots of, um, an awful lot of songs and stories as well. And, um, and you know, sometimes you sort of see hear them around school actually singing the songs that, that they, they've learned in, in my lessons, and which, you know, which is always lovely. And, and, you know, talking about all the other languages that are spoken within our school, we've got about, I think, last count, we've got about 35 different languages that our children speak. And they're really, really important. And I think very often, um, you know, we sort of... We, we focus on, you know, we've, we've got to, we've got to improve English, we've got to improve English, but actually the languages that children speak at home, that's their identity. And I was saying to my children at school the other day that, you know, nobody should ever tell you that it's wrong to speak your language because it, it's who you are basically. And, um, and I do find as well that the children, you know, that they, first of all, they will speak, um, their home language to their parents and they can just completely flip into English at school or if they're talking to their friends so it sort of shows that actually children who are bilingual don't get confused by by different languages and um but also the uh, the children in their classes excuse me <coughs> sorry I've got a bit of a cold coming the children in their classes are they're, they're really desperate to sort of learn how to say something in their their friend's 
languages as well so it's such a great age for them to start exploring different languages and also you know we we tend to try and look at the links between different languages as well in my classes because some of the things when I'm teaching them Spanish they sort of struggle to really understand that maybe adjectives come after nouns in Spanish whereas in English they come before the nouns and they'll sort of look at me and go well that's that's really silly so I'll maybe say to the some of the other children in the class well what about in Polish what happens in Polish what happens in um Romanian what happens in Punjabi and, and you know we sort of tend to try and go around different languages and as soon as they realize in their friends home languages things are a little bit different maybe the word order they'll accept that Spanish is that's okay it's not weird or wrong it's actually okay so I think you know it's really um, really powerful that we do have other um, other speakers of other languages in our classrooms as well. Uh, fabulous. And speaking of all this happiness and enthusiasm, I just want to take the opportunity to remind you of our sponsor this evening, who is the Happy Confident Company. And they provide mental health and well-being tools that you can use in your class for 10 minutes a day just to boost morale, cheer people up, make sure that everyone's feeling their best selves. And if you want to find out more about the Happy Confident Com Company, you need to go to www.happyconfident.com. So just adding on to what you both said about languages starting younger and about this enthusiasm that, that young children have in particular. I mean, not only are they very spongy at that age, they absorb everything, but they also just want to, to learn, uh, you know, from everybody around them. They don't see any kind of other or they're, they're not sort of they haven't sort of been tainted in any way or ruined by I don't know, the sort of unfortunately sad things that can happen in the world around us and they do just want to you know be friends with everybody and and, and learn from from everybody around them but uh, there's an article i found um i should let you both know that i enjoy a research rabbit hole so i do try and find things that sort of underpin what we're talking about um and it it talks about uh, uh two things between uh that are important uh, uh and the reasoning behind the introduction of, of foreign languages in primary classrooms uh, the first belief is that the younger the better, the idea that young children are intrinsically better language learners and will therefore become more proficient more quickly. The second is that in an increasingly globalised world, intercultural competence is essential and that it is important to awaken children's interest in other people and cultures at a time when they are open and receptive. Uh, more recent arguments are based on the cognitive advantages that learning a foreign language brings, such as enhanced problem solving, attention control or ability to switch tasks, and on the claim that it helps with literacy in English. But these arguments have not yet filtered into public discourse. I wondered if you uh, wanted to either one of you wanted to add anything to that or endorse endorse that in any way. Um, I did a talk a few years ago about um, in, uh, about very very early language learning, and one of the pieces of uh, research that I read, I can't say who who wrote it, I can't remember, and I'm not at home, so I can't go and look it up. But it was talking about how our brain is wired when we're born with, with, the, with the neural pathways to speak any language in the world. And as we grow older, if we haven't heard the sounds of those languages, the neural pathways find other things to do. But we have the possibility to speak any language when we're born. So the earlier you can expose children to different languages, the more likely it is their neural pathways to continue learning those sounds will stay connected and I found that absolutely fascinating and it kind of explains I mean you can reconnect them again but obviously it's better if, if, they're, if they're, they're, they're kept um, intact but I found that absolutely fascinating that I was born with the possibility to speak any language in the world um, I just it just blew my mind almost literally <laughs> um, yeah. but yeah I, I do think that that learning languages does give you the ability to problem solve um, and I think that's one of the key skills that children are learning when we teach them languages at, at key stage two. One of, the, one of the key things I want my, my pupils to come out of their language learning uh, is not just being able to speak Spanish, but understanding that, like Anna was talking about, that different languages work in different ways and not to be scared by things like, you know, um, in Spanish you have two groups of nouns, you have masculine and feminine. Um, and it's the same in French. 
in German, there's three groups of nouns. Um, and to have those problem solving skills, I don't understand every word, but what can I do? I can look for cognates. I can look at, look at the pictures in, in a text like I would with an English book. Um, and the reinforcing of their, of their English literacy, of their first language, um, is also really key in that. And they do work together. So, you know, being, being told, oh, it, it's just going to confuse them. It, the children that are coming in that don't speak English, it'll just confuse them if you teach them another language. I, d I don't prescribe to that because I think their literacy skills will be enhanced because you are, we're reinforcing the skills they already use and giving them new skills as well and giving them another pool of um, an another set of examples to work with in their problem solving. I don't know. Anna probably has something to say about that as well. And I don't want to hog the time. Oh, you're not at all. Uh, I can see Anna's just unmuted herself and wanting to add something. Go ahead, Anna. Uh, no, I just, well, I, I completely, completely agree. And I think, you know, that it's something that I keep saying to, um, you know, to sort of my colleagues that learning a language can really help improve your English. Um, and, you know, it can give you a much richer vocabulary as well because you've got so many, um, so many words, so much etymology, words in English that actually evolve from maybe Latin and obviously I teach Spanish. So, um, you know, there are so many words that you can sort of find the links between and the roots of, which actually improves English so much more and I think as well that you know when when children are learning grammar if they're just learning grammar in their own language it's almost a bit abstract it's kind of you know but when they've got another language to actually map that grammar onto they can actually sort of see why they need to know what a noun is why they need to know what an adjective but they've actually they can sort of see how everything slots together as well and um and certainly i've seen that in um in some of the classes that i've been teaching um i tend to do some work on verbs in uh, spanish verbs in year around year five um and um and it, it's really sort of shown me that that children have understood their english grammar better through learning spanish as well um yeah fantastic um alex i can see that i think you finally you finally made it i don't know how much you've you've caught from this but let's get you on and get you into the mix as well how are you doing hello i am so sorry for the delay with this um it's quite ironic so i wanted to at some point talk about technology in mfl and um it's taken me half an hour to get in as a speaker um, to this so apologies I've been trying to listen to different things as they've gone on and I think the conversation has been really interesting most recently talking about um, the cognitive advantages of learning a language and I'm a big advocate for learning as young as possible so at my school we teach from um, when the girls start at our school aged four um, in reception um, and I think was it you Anna that was just talking about um, that languages help um, with English so much, especially with the grammar. And um, making those connections is something that I talk to the students about all the time. Make those connections. What do you notice? Um, and it really helps with reading the classics as well. So more, the more antiquated language in English um, can be related to foreign languages, particularly um, the Romance languages. So it, it does help um, the students learn like that. Oh, definitely. And Alex, I just want you to give a, a brief introduction to your oh, yes. edu educational background, because it was I mean, I, I know you explained it to me briefly earlier, but it's just your just from where you come from with all this is, is quite fascinating. So if you wouldn't mind, could you just quickly share with us? Yes, of course. Sorry. So um, my setting's a little bit different in the fact that I'm working at an independent school. Um, we um, accept entries from reception but once the girls start the school they then stay until year 13 so they have the expectation that they will go up to the senior school um, and therefore our MFL provision in the junior school isn't about becoming fluent in any one language now I know the key stage two um, framework that you mentioned right at the beginning of the podcast does look at wanting to become not fluent in one language but the focus is on one language throughout key stage two but we actually teach five different languages in the junior school we teach spanish for three years in reception year one and year two 
And then once they get into um, Key Stage 2, they have four different languages. So they, they learn Russian, German, Mandarin, Chinese, and then they finish with French in Year 6. And the idea is to become linguists and not fluent in one language. So they um, learn to study a language, they learn what grammar is, and they learn it in different contexts, and they learn to make those connections, like I was saying earlier, um, between the languages, so that they start... Um, in the senior school, when we get a big intake um, of students again, so the, I think the population of a year group more than doubles, um, we don't want about a third or, even, or up to a half of the, the students much further along in one language so that they're language learners and they've got this, um, these, these key language le skills um, that they've developed in the junior school. And they do actually start their MFL journey in the senior school with a linguistics course that runs for about a half term where they learn um, a lot of the grammar skills, et cetera, um, and etymology and language families, et cetera, so that they're really um, making those connections. I just think that that's a, a fascinating approach. And I don't know um, if Lisa or Anna, if you've uh, ever come across anything like that or uh, in, in places you have worked in, in the past. I mean, I've never I've certainly never known uh, Russian to be taught at a, at a young age or, or Mandarin. But I know, obviously, you know, that Mandarin is being taught more widely now because, well, because of the influence that, that China has on the world. I don't know if any, either of the two of you want to, to leap in. Sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. Um, when I first started, when I first started teaching at uh, my other school, my second school, they actually had an approach at that point where each year group did a different language. So they did um, French, Spanish, German, and Mandarin, I think. Um, but when I joined, it was at the point at which languages had become statutory. And the programme of study um, is quite clear that you need to make substantial progress in a language. And the head teacher at the time wanted it to be one language, which is, is what basically the, the program, his interpretation of the programme of study and probably my interpretation would be you really have to stick with one if you are going to follow that programme of study. So it was chosen to be Spanish. Um, so I, th I, th I think that's really, really interesting. I've seen models um, like, like the one, I'm terrible, uh, like, like the one that, that's just been shared. I, I'm Alex. really sorry. Alex. Alex. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Gosh, don't don't apologise. I turned up 30 <laughs> minutes late, so I can't, you know, it's fine to forget my name. It's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm not, I'm not at home, you see. So I'd have written everything down with notes. I don't have a pen with me. I'm on my holidays. So um, anyway. <laughs> I've seen models, models like this before. There's one at the moment, um, I think it's called Wallow, um, where you look at language awareness. There was also um, a few years ago, um, uh, I think it was Joan Dickey had, uh, I think that's the right person, had a model where um, that it was based around language awareness rather than learning a particular language. And I think the, the idea of learning to be a linguist and all those different languages is, is really, really great. But in my context, I need to follow the programme of study. Um, and therefore, it has to be a language. And the language in, in both my schools have chosen is Spanish, partly because Spanish is a language that um, is supp <laughs> supposedly, I think it's, it's, it's quite easy to learn because what you see is what you get. Um, and once you've learned those few, few key sounds that are slightly different, like the H uh, for the letter J um, and the F for a Z or a, or a, a C and an I or an E. Um, and we can talk, of course, about South America and also the South of Spain having a slightly different pronunciation of that. Um, once you've learned those sounds, it's very much read what you see. Um, that was one of the reasons. The other reason was because... Um, of, the, of transition and most of the children will go on to learn French um, at secondary school most of us the children will go to a school where they start with French so it was decided at both schools that they would do Spanish at primary so that that sticky point of transition was kind of they had that language behind them and they can apply all the skills they've had in that language to a new one I think that answered the question 
I I really I'm sorry I was just going to say on that on your reason for going with Spanish um being that easier language that's exactly why we chose it for reception year one and year two because we only introduced um Spanish to those age groups about three years ago um and it's exactly it's exactly for that reason and it has been so useful in the sense that um our students have been learning phonics obviously to read in English but it it we're not teaching phonics in our language programs like I know some um, schools are doing um, some phonics to help them learn to read, but they can read Spanish really easily, especially picking out those certain sounds like the double L, the J, the Z, etc., and knowing that they're different. But that's, again, me saying to the students, right, you know that this is different, so when you come to learn other languages, you will find that certain letters are different, and that's about becoming a linguist, right? Identifying those things that make a language different or bring connections and make similarities to, to your home language or predominantly English, I suppose. Exactly, and that's, and that's exactly it. We talk about putting your Spanish glasses on. You know, when you look at the word chocolate... With your English glasses, it says chocolate. You put your Spanish ones on. Oh, it doesn't say chocolate anymore. It says chocolate. So I love that. Almost, oh. but you know, and if you look at all your Spanish eyes, and a child once said to me, we, we had a, a Spanish native speaker in the class, and they went, it's not fair. It's not fair when Nora's, Nora's reading Spanish because she can do it. And I said, yeah, but she has to wear English glasses the whole time at school. And they went, oh, yes, so she does. And oh. that almost... It almost made them think, actually, no, that's true, isn't it? She, she might have the advantage with Spanish, but she is actually wearing a pair of glasses the whole time to help her with her English. So, I mean, that's just the way, the, the way we talk about it. And I said, you need a different pair of, pair of glasses for different languages, don't you? So if you're going to look, um, you know, in, in German, wand in English is something you wave in the air. Wand in German is a wall. You know, a gift in English is something nice. Gift in German is poison. So, you oh, know, wow. it's quite, sometimes it's quite important that you know the difference. Um, so, yeah, more anecdotes. Sorry. I was just going to say as well that I talk about Wurzel Gummidge heads, if anybody remembers Wurzel Gummidge. I know there's a, there's sort of, uh, the BBC of um have um, sort of made it a newer version. So some of our children have seen it, but I tell them they've got to take their English head off and put their Spanish head on. Wurzel Gummidge used to scare the life out of me when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's a li- little less scary now. Oh, wow. I mean, I tell you what, I mean, I was sort of, my, my heart was swelling as I was listening to, to those various explanations. I think Alex was having a moment as well, from what I could tell. He was uh, loving the, the, the glasses idea. But also, just the other thing is uh, bringing people together who, um, and bringing teachers together, which is, big thing that on teachers talk radio that we obviously love doing the whole point and just listening to you all kind of appreciate each other sort of little bits and pieces i was just sitting there going oh this is great so sorry that was a, a very random tangent but uh no i'm glad you're all here and having a lovely time now the um i just wanted to backtrack for a second because um apparently that uh whole thing about uh being born with um the innate ability to speak a language is called the critical period hypothesis there you go. I've just found a, a, a name for it, Lisa. So uh, I, I thank you very it. much. I can't remember if that's what you said or if you said it or not, but uh, it is uh, here in front of me. Now, another thing I wanted to um, touch on with all of you and Lisa, I'm conscious that you um, need to, to leave us in a moment. But um, I mean, having lived in uh, lived on the continent now for, for a while, it, it's very clear to me and I've kind of been in and around Europe sort of all of my life um that uh the children from a young age in school um or our european counterparts are learning language from a young age and certainly when i've run into uh, and met families with teenagers and things on holiday they're already two or three languages deep um and speaking them at quite a, a competent level and i just wonder i mean certainly when i was at school uh, in the in the uk which okay was you know, decade and a half ago now at this point, but they're just language learning was there. It was, you know, I had I had good language teachers, but there just didn't seem to be uh, the the sort of the emphasis on on its importance. 
And I certainly don't feel in any of the primary schools that I taught in the UK that that emphasis was was there either. I mean, I know that there are wonderful teachers like yourself that that exist and that are absolutely advocating for this, and that it is very much part, certainly um, a statutory part of the Key Stage 2 curriculum now. But I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on why... uh, and I'm going to say the UK, but, you know, England, for argument's sake, or the UK in general, because I think it is actually a UK thing, really. Why they're just, and I don't know if Brexit has exacerbated this, and I don't know, because I feel like it was there before, but what are your thoughts on to what, as to why maybe our, our sort of language teaching just is so far behind everybody else in, in Europe? And I'm just going to cut in there and say a massive thanks to the Happy Confident Company, who sponsor all our shows and support all our shows on Teachers Talk Radio. Um, You can find out more about them. They basically offer well-being programs, well-being courses, um, all things well-being for staff and students, but particularly for students, 10 minutes a day um, to help them essentially, I guess, get in touch with their own thoughts and emotions and feelings. Um, And they've got 120,000 active users on Happy Confidence. So check them out www.happyconfident.com um, you can sign up there for free and, and see what they have to offer you and your school and we really appreciate um, the support from Happy Confident Company at Teachers Talk Radio back to Lucy hope you haven't forgotten a question now after that no I haven't forgotten the question <laughs> well, I, well I, okay. I have because oh, <laughs> I have I, I was uh, anyway moving on sorry Lisa go ahead <laughs> I was going to say, uh, you were asking about um, uh, the UK being behind the rest of Europe. Yeah, um, that was it. I have, to, <laughs> um, I have to say England is much further behind Scotland. Scotland has a much more coherent language strategy that's called two plus one, where children um, learn uh, two, two languages. They start um, in primary. I, I can't quote the exact years they start but they start one language and then after a few years they start a second language and it's two plus plus i was just gonna say sorry lisa it's one one plus two so one is it the english and then two they do two foreign languages sorry to put it yes yeah 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 no 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 that's that's what i meant i just said it the other way around (laughs) yeah they do two foreign languages and then the the one is their, their own language um i think i know i know that anna has got loads that she can say about this and I do need to go in about three minutes time so I'll just address one of the points I think one of the points is there is still the thought amongst far too many that the whole world speaks English and that's enough and it is not enough I mean it's really not enough Um, you miss out on so much not being able to speak languages I mean I, I tweeted um I tweeted in response to someone earlier today um, that if you don't speak, it, when you speak to people in other languages, you get new experiences, new opportunities arrive, and you you actually speak to people's hearts. Yeah, that's right. Um, Vincent uh, said earlier, if you speak French, German or Spanish, your life will be different if, to if you don't. And I responded, this is certainly my experience. Speaking to someone in their own language opens doors to opportunities, experiences, and most importantly, to people's hearts. And my school has recently been involved in an Erasmus Plus project. Um, It's the last one we'll ever be able to do because of Brexit. Um, But there we are. And as part of that, we had um, visits to the, the schools that are involved. The first school we visited was in Spain. I'm fluent in Spanish. The second school, and I spoke to the children, and that was absolutely amazing. The second school was in, in Austria. And I've been, <laughs> I've been learning German. And I really had to throw myself in at the deep end because a lot of the children, that they, they were younger and their English wasn't quite up to the standard I thought it was going to be. So I threw myself in and I taught a lesson about Guy Fawkes in German. I was so proud of myself, but I was so scared doing it. But speaking to them in their own language, you could see their little faces lit up. They could speak English, but I spoke to them in their language. Uh, the same happened uh, in Turkey. I do not speak Turkish at all, but I'd learned some phrases. And because I could say those few phrases, I was the person they wanted to come and talk to because they had that connection. And in Greece as well, I'd learned some phrases. And I spoke, because I'd learned those few phrases, it was literally a handful of phrases. I was speaking to them in their language. If I just talked to them in English, they loved the other people on the, on, on the, in the project too. 
I'd spoken their language and that made it different. And that's the experience I want my pupils to have. I really am going to have to go. <laughs> my husband is waiting a... for me. But no, that's, I, that's I just wanted a... to say that. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> That's such a lovely note to leave us on. And thank you so much for, for making time for all of us this evening. We really do appreciate it. Now, please, please, please do go with, uh, with all of our blessing and have a, have a lovely time. And thank you for joining us on your holiday. Appreciate That's fine. it. And uh, thanks, to, thanks to Anna and Alex as well. Uh, good oh. luck and keep, keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> it was lovely to speak with you, Lisa. Thanks. What an absolute star. Oh, and and on holiday as well. So that is real commitment to to the languages. Um, just uh, adding on to to what Lisa said, I don't know who wants to to leap in first about uh, this whole idea that, uh, and I think there is a, a a sort of sad prevailing idea that uh, you know you can kind of that you can speak um, English wherever you go, and it is true in a lot of places you you can. And certainly when I was promoting the show, I was I, I did find a lot of. Um, and it wasn't kind of accidental that I posted a lot of these uh, gifts, like the um, the uh, one from Only Fools and Horses with Del Boy shouting Monge 2 at the top of his voice, and uh, the joke from Friends when Phoebe tries to teach um, Joey some French, because that does seem to follow uh, English speakers, or native English yeah. speakers it's like a bit around. So, uh, Alex, I feel like you have some thoughts think, on this. Yeah, I think you're totally right, that right there and I think um, as a people in Britain in general we have this idea that learning language A is really hard Um, a lot of our um, parents generation found language learning really boring and they really didn't enjoy it and it was one of those um, things about the British education system where for example, it's okay to be a bad mathematician. It's okay to be bad at maths. And a lot of parents speak to their children and say, it's okay, I was bad at maths at school. And it's not okay um, to say that to your child because you make them believe it's okay to be bad at maths. And then they go into the math lessons and they think it's okay to be bad at maths. But it's the same with language learning. And people see it as a, it's not needed because of globalisation, because um, 200 years ago, America became this big power and the UK spread its language through um, the, the the Commonwealth and through um, all of the um, exploring that they did and taking over of these countries, which was awful. They spread this language and it, is, it has become um, this global language, but it's entrenched in the British people's thoughts that they then don't need to learn the language. However, other countries um, like France and Germany um, and even Spain um, and Southern Europe, they do learn a language, but from a much earlier age. And I think, am I right in thinking that you only need to learn a language from age seven? Yeah, that's the um, the, the national curriculum. That's when it's supposed to be compulsory. Uh, but it should yeah. be a, a seven year course from year year three through to year nine. And then it becomes an right. option for GCSE. And you see there, we're failing our students again, where we're saying you can drop Mm. out of it um, at age 14. When So they're seeing it as this optional course, an optional subject, an optional thing to do. And so they don't have the same um, buy-in to this subject like you do with science and you obviously do with maths and English. But I, I see it as such a fundamental core subject um, that's so important and I, I, I used to work in Thailand and speaking to Thai people over there because their English levels are very low but when I learnt Thai and I could speak in Thai and this is something that Lise was saying speaking to another person in their language is so important it's so caring and kind and people hear that and it means so much to them um, so yeah I'm a big advocate for that but I think it's, it, it's the British people's belief in languages that's I think a a, a root problem that we have yeah can I butt in there as well can I come in because you're absolutely right and I think you know the problem now is that we've got less and less people who are speaking languages in this country I mean you look at university courses when I was at university I think we had 80 80 students on our 
course who were pure linguists. We just did a pure, pure language um, degree with two, di two different languages. Um, and there are now at least a third, maybe more now actually, of university language courses that have closed across the country. Um, there are certainly nowhere near um, 80 students on a course. I know that um, that one of our local universities is about to close their language course because they've only had five applicants for next year and they reckon that will probably um, transfer into about one and a half students. Um, and so the less and less language students that we get, it becomes even more of a problem because people don't have the, the expertise out there. And the biggest problem, I think, is that we just don't spend enough time learning languages in this country. So in school, certainly in primary school, I get one lesson a week. Now, in my main school, I have an hour a week, but I do also do a little bit of teaching in our um, sister school. And I get about half an hour a week there. Now, I always say to the children, because they say, oh, I'm rubbish at Spanish. And I say, if you only had one lesson of maths a week and you only had 30 minutes, you wouldn't make very much progress in it. But we give all that time to maths, to English, because it's important and we recognise that we're not going to become, or our students are not going to become really good if they don't have maths and English every day. And yet languages, I think there's, there's such a lack of understanding out there, particularly, um, you know, from some leaders and also lots of politicians as well. Um, and it's just not given that importance. But actually... The British Academy um, report of 2019 suggests that we actually, the UK economy loses out on £48 billion a year due to the lack of languages that are spoken in the workplace. And I think it was Alex talking about how we're really letting our children down. And in the future, we've seen over COVID how we can actually do our jobs from home over the internet now. And I just think that in 10, 15 years time, our young people are going to be competing for jobs across the world with their peers. And who's going to employ our monolingual children, our monolingual young people, um, when, you know, they could employ somebody, a person from China who speaks three, four, five different languages and can communicate with a much wider part of the world than, than our, our monolingual children. And it's just something that I'm really passionate about at the moment. I'm really, really trying to, to um, sort of make more people aware that things have got to change in our schools. Absolutely. And I think that we talk so much now about international mindedness and I've, I've, um, I've given talks on this and uh, about, you know, being part of a world that in many ways is getting, is getting smaller, but, people do need to do need to connect and we talk as teachers a lot about you know if we want children to do certain things then we have to model that it's you know it's even part of the teacher standards that uh, we have to you know that we're expected to behave and act in a certain way and that um you know that that there are you know kind of minimum expectations of us you know we model certain behaviors we model like we did do for any other class and I think it was I can't remember I think it was Lisa who was talking about sort of learning a few phrases um to go here and there but uh that that's great and we should certainly I mean obviously not all children have the the privilege to be able to to go abroad and and to and to travel but um even within communities within the UK you know we have so many different languages spoken and again and I don't you know I'm obviously mindful of not making this political it's not a political podcast but to me there are very clear reasons as to why that is and if you are going to teach children how to move around in society from a young age part of that or a massive part of that is is the communication rather than just becoming coming up a parody of someone shouting you know someone who's kind of lobster lobster red somewhere shouting thinking that if they shout louder in english that they'll make themselves understood yeah i think as well you know the one of the big problems is that that i find that not just young people, but when I've taught adults as well, they're scared of making the tiniest of little mistakes. And, and if they don't, they're going to be absolutely perfect. They won't even have a go. Whereas I always say to my children, you know, you make mistakes in your own language, which they don't really understand. And one of um, my sort of favourite um, sort of anecdotes to tell is that um, for some reason, a lot of children in, in our school, if they need to go to the toilet, they, they'll put their hands up and they'll say, 
can I have a toilet or can I do a toilet? And I usually look at them when they sort of say, can I have a toilet? My response is, I don't think the caretaker will be too happy. <laughs> but, but I still understand what they want, but their English is incorrect. And it makes me sort of, you know, not... <laughs> I don't mean laugh in a bad way, but they're quite happy to speak English badly, but they're scared when maybe I'm the only person in the room that can understand what they're saying it's in Spanish, that they are scared to, to say something if they're going to make a mistake in another language. Anna, I, th I think you're totally right there. And I think they... Um... I, I have the same problem in my classroom where they say, can I go toilet? And I'll, I'll look at them. And if it's a repeat offender, they'll, they'll realise what they've just done. But I do wonder if that's part of it when we're constantly as teachers, getting them to improve and getting them to perfect their English, their writing, their speaking and all of this. And I wonder if that's part of, you know, uh, being fearful of making those, um, Oh, making those errors in a foreign language and it's it's that heightened fear because they don't know how to correct it and they don't actually know if they've got it right or wrong whereas they can hear their errors in English because that's their predominantly is their first language isn't it so I wonder if that's part of it I think it's I think it's possible I mean it's I'm just sitting here thinking gosh that there, there's a point maybe there's I mean of course as we have discovered already this conversation about uh, modern foreign languages and about languages in, in general goes much much deeper and I'm so glad it has um, than just talking about language learning this is sort of a small part of a much much bigger thing in teaching globally beyond um, and we have such a kind of yeah there is such a, a perfectionism that doesn't necessarily come from us but comes from the amount of curriculum we have to get through what we have to tick off at, at certain levels and of course that creeps in you know children are uh, are not daft they know you know if you're kind of saying in one subject right it's got to be like this it's got to be a certain way if you're going to tick off you know if we're going to give you kind of this level then it has to be like this of course that's then going to to filter it down into into other things so there is a a mentality certainly that uh needs needs looking at for sure i don't know who wants to to leap in here yeah no it, it's so right and uh yeah um yeah just to agree with you really um the other thing i do find as well is that you know i quite often get children taken out for interventions and um for you know for other because they haven't finished their english work or whatever and i was saying to um i think i was talking to to my head teacher the other day and i said you know that it's almost like trying to build a house in the air without any foundation underneath or you know just just complete air underneath that learning a language is about those building blocks. And so, you know, when you've got children missing parts of your lesson or, um, you know, not sort of having, not having those regular language lessons, they've kind of missed those blocks, which, you know, they need in, in every other subject as well, but they'll kind of make that time up in particularly maths and English because they're the core subjects. Um, and it just makes it, I suppose children are, they get even more worried about it because they've missed those building blocks and they don't quite, and they're, they're sort of really worried that almost the house is going to completely collapse on them and and they don't know how to, they don't know how to fill those gaps. I think it's, yeah, it's a, it's a sad thing because actually um, there was a situation or certainly in, um, in uh, my school out here, that's what children were taken out of. They were taken out of their Portuguese lessons because it was felt like, well, if they're, um, you know, if they're needing support with reading and writing, then surely another language would, would be too much for them. But as research has quite clearly contradicted, you know, it's having having the uh, the additional language is actually beneficial. So uh, that was um, clearly we hadn't we hadn't done our research as, as a school there. But also just wanted to tap into something else that um, I can't remember if one or both of you have said about teacher confidence. And this has come up in a number of things 
that a number of subjects that I've talked about, music being a particular one that comes to mind, PE being another, uh, where teachers who maybe aren't MFL specialists, and it seems like um, you, you primary MFL specialists are, are hard to come by, as, as it as it turns out. And we've kind of discussed as to why that is, you know, with language uptake and everything else in universities and people specialising in certain things. But in terms of kind of teacher confidence and teacher CPD and things like that, if as a primary teacher you're not an MFL specialist, what would your advice be i guess into kind of at the very least drip feeding some foreign languages into your into your classrooms or kind of making sure there's just some some exposure even if it's not explicit teaching as it were what can what can you what would you say to them to 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 just get started get something in the mix i'm going to butt in again just to say um because you were talking about confidence i thought it's a perfect segue um, to say thank you very much and a massive shout out to the Happy Confident Company who sponsor this show on Teachers Talk Radio. Um, if you want to check out what they do, 10 minutes well-being a day for staff and students, particularly students. I mentioned them probably about 20 minutes ago. If you missed that, then please head over to their website, happyconfident.com. Find out what they do. Sign up for free. Get involved. Um, it's a really amazing project and we really appreciate them supporting uh, everything we do here at TTR. And hopefully that's a little bit of thinking time for Lucy's question. I can answer Lucy's question. Well, I, I say I can answer it. I'm not quite, sh- quite sure that I can answer it exactly as you've asked the question, Lucy. But because uh, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I haven't really sort of thought individual primary teachers, how do they get started? Um themselves if they haven't sort of got that support around them but I can tell you about what we're trying to do in Coventry um I sort of set up an organization um a couple of years ago now with a friend and um we've been working a lot with um people from Coventry Council Coventry City Council and also the universities and we are trying um it's a bit of a slow process at the moment but what we want to do is we want to try and upskill our primary school teachers in coventry um so that they have got those skills to go into the classroom because we're absolutely aware that you know if you if you have if you don't speak another language it must be terrifying occasionally i've been asked to go and teach something you know, other than languages in, in one of my schools. And I kind of go into complete panic mode because I wasn't trained to teach primary and I don't know how, I don't understand all the, the terminology of, you know, if someone says go and teach the bus stop method, I still don't know what the bus stop method is in, in, in maths. And, um, and it's a really scary prospect. So, but I think this is what, you know, cities, trusts, LAs, where they still exist, need to be doing is looking at, how to upskill their their primary teachers in order to be able to do that. There's some brilliant work going on in Hackney as well. Um, a lady called um, um, who's those? Did you know what their names have just suddenly escaped me? But anyway, two ladies in um, in Hackney who are doing some amazing work again with all of their primary schools. All the primary schools are on board. Um, so I guess I probably would say to any primary school teachers, maybe reach out to your secondary schools, first of all, um, you know, get that relationship with the heads of departments in your um, in the secondary schools that your children will be going to. Um, maybe sort of speak to um, people in education at the local authority. Um, as I say, one of our um, the key people that we work with is um, somebody in school improvement who is a real advocate for languages. She's not a languages teacher. She was a, a, a primary school teacher, but she really is passionate about languages in primary school. And she's been a fantastic help and also helped us to get to other people where we can start to get that message across as well. Um, and also the universities, I say they've got a real interest in this because they're finding that their courses are having to to close down because they're not having enough people coming through to learn languages. So they've got a real invested interest as well. And I know that both of our local universities um, are doing some fantastic outreach work as well in schools, both primary and secondary, in order to try and really, um, you know, get students to think about the benefits of language teaching 
um, and also helping to upskill teachers. Um, you've also got actually, if you're teaching Spanish, the um, the Spanish embassy the education department in the spanish embassy they're fantastic they've got resources um they can they've got courses that they do both online and in person um and if you're teaching french or german you've got the the goethe institute for german who have got some great work going on they'd be more than happy to help and the french institute as well if you're teaching french so maybe i did answer your question lucy I think you did beautiful. I think you more than did, uh, Anna. Alex, I don't know if you... I concur, to... absolutely. That was a, a very, very thoughtful um, and really comprehensive way of supporting those teachers who don't really have the confidence or the subject knowledge to be able to teach um, any modern foreign language that we have in our schools at the moment. Um, and I don't really have any insight into what support there is out there at the moment for the schools um like Anna just had but what I do think and this is not something that I have but this is something that I think we need to be moving towards is utilizing the technology that is being developed so quickly and I know um the um the podcast here has has, has had on the uh, teach talk radio talk about AI and its use in um teaching etc but um I think things like Microsoft's reading progress, which is a way of tracking a child's ability um, to read, um, something that teachers um, at the moment use in English, but you can use it in any language. So I've actually had my year twos reading Spanish and then the reading uh, progress um, it's AI has picked up on which words they didn't read accurately and it's giving them those words to practice and they had to repractice it until they got the correct pronunciation. And that's just a small part of using technology. Now, that's not just to help the children, but we can really help teachers as well here. And I think giving um, language teaching through technology is definitely the next step. And I do not want to remove that physical person in the classroom that's not that's not me I don't, I don't want to do that I want to underpin um, great face-to-face teaching with the amazing technology that we've got out there and I know that there's there's definitely some amazing ways that we can use even things like Seesaw um, to really support teaching and if there are banks of resources on seesaw if there are banks of resources um with a, a a language company that can be given out to teachers and those teachers who are um very open to learning the language themselves and learn with the children that is a great way of doing it they might not necessarily be able to pick up on where their language pronunciation has gone wrong but they'll be the cheerleaders for those children saying right let's have another go let's try it again what did you learn today and i think that's something else having those teachers who are open and willing to learn with their students i think that's that that's probably something that's quite important yeah i think that's really that's sorry no, go ahead, Anna. i was just saying i think it's really important actually that if if teachers can sort of show their vulnerability vulnerable, vulnerability to their students and actually you know learn with them i think that's a really powerful thing to show the children is that you know i'm not the expert but that's okay, you know, I'm willing to have a go, I'm willing to, you know, I'm happy to make mistakes and learn from them. Um, and that, that's really, really powerful. Um, can, can I just, there's just one other thing that I was thinking as well, actually, as, as Alex was talking, um, what you were saying about where do primary teachers, um, you know, how, how do they get upskilled? And am I allowed to sort of give the name of an organisation who um, will help you to make links with countries other schools in countries around the world is that okay yeah i'm sure just uh just just to name it, I'm sure okay it's fine. yeah global schools alliance um or gsa if you look those up on the uh, the internet um then they will you know I, I've, I've seen myself that lisa was talking about erasmus plus um projects and i used to do a lot of e-twinning which was part of um, erasmus plus and the children absolutely loved it as soon as they had those links with real children in real classrooms who are real spanish speakers not pretend ones like i always say i am because i'm not a i'm not a native spanish speaker um you know it just their interest is just you've just got them basically and um and it's become you know so much harder since since brexit to 
to make those links because we no longer have access to Erasmus. But actually, I know, I know, I know oh, I'm, I'm trying to hold back here. But you know, the, the the GSA, you know, they they have got some great links, and um, and certainly the best way to get your children really interested is working collaboratively with children in schools in other countries. Yeah, it's contextualising the learning, yeah. isn't it? That's so important. Real life context, uh, absolutely. Yeah. No, sorry, Alex, carry on. I interrupted you there. No, no, that was that's what all I was saying. I was just saying Anna said it perfectly, like contextualising the learning. That's why children have that buzz. Um, if you contextualise the learning in any subject that you teach, the children get more interested, you get more buy-in from them. And I think giving them those opportunities to speak to other people from other countries in that language and be spoken to, it's just, it's wonderful. And in, I think, and they're saying using this company, GSA, give those opportunities to do things like that. It's, it's great. Yeah, and it's just, it is, of course, you know, again, without going down the the political rabbit hole, it is sad that we're that in the UK those those links are are decreasing, um, and that you know a lot some of them don't actually exist anymore. But having said that, there are I mean, as as you both have said, there are still ways. You know, where there is a will, there's a way with with all these things. And if you want to make these things happen, you absolutely can. And certainly, I think there's also uh, they also need to be a want and um, an interest from from leadership, from from management in schools to to say, you know, to really endorse endorse language learning to really make it a fundamental part as much as it is you know, part of the curriculum from Key Stage 2, but it doesn't, you know, you don't have to just stick to that. It, it, there's so much more that can be done on that. And in terms of the teacher side of things, again, having that vulnerability and having that, uh, um, it is difficult for, for a lot of teachers. And this is, again, a discussion I've had across a number of subjects with a number of uh, different teachers that I've spoken to or different experts in different areas who've said, you know, it is easy to sit there and say, you know, be vulnerable and, uh, you know, show that you're learning along with them. And, uh, you know, it's taken me certainly a long time in certain subjects to kind of even go near the idea in some cases. And I think MFL um, is 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 one of them. But with the right, you know, with, with certain resources and things like that, it can be something that uh, even if you're not an expert, that you can... Uh, that you can get uh, get involved in. And I also think that, um, and again, this is something that comes up a lot, in terms of teacher training, I mean, I know that you can uh, certainly, as a primary teacher, you can specialise in, in, in MFL, but I trained as a non-specialist and I don't remember anything about MFL coming up at all, which is shocking in a way. I can't think of any any nod to it whatsoever, which is... Again, I mean, I don't know what that would look like in a, in some sessions in a in a, a primary PGC or primary teacher training of of any sort. But surely there's a. I mean, I don't know if there is space for that. It's maybe another conversation for another time. But you know, to overlook it altogether seems almost criminal, really. Do you know? I think. What? Well, actually, on my PGCE, I think it would have been overlooked if it wasn't for me as a recent language graduate who was quite excited to be able to speak French or Spanish to the students that I was going to be teaching. So I think they kind of thought, oh, we're going to have to talk about it. There were other universities that did uh, PGCE, uh, primary PGCE with French or with Spanish so that you could then go do one of your placements abroad. But I didn't get onto that PGCE. Um, I didn't apply because it was in, in a different city of where I was living at the time. Um, and I think we should have more opportunities for those. And it, I'm really sad to hear that universities are dropping courses when, in fact, they need to be increasing the provision and encouraging more graduates to go into those positions because we need the teachers and we, we need them to have that subject knowledge and that passion and drive to move our languages forwards, definitely. I think, sadly, as well, you know, this sort of the pressure is is on getting the results in maths and English. And I think until that changes, and that's got to be done at a much higher level than leaders within our schools, until that changes, it, it, languages are not going to become 
more important in, in you know, certainly in, a, in the majority of schools because teachers and schools and head teachers are being judged on their English and maths results. And I think that's what's got to happen. It's got to come from higher up. It's got to come from the very, very, very top. I'm trying not to be political here, but uh, that, you know, until that happens, nothing's going to change very much. Gosh, you know what, Anna, I think you're really right there. Um, I'm I'm lucky in the sense that I work in a school where we don't have, um, we don't do the year six SATs um, and we don't have to as part of being an independent school. We still have a core focus on mathematics and English and those two subjects are taught every day. But our subjects are quite ring-fenced and quite protected. So music and drama and languages and science and all of those subjects, they're quite protected in the sense that they get taught every week. Um, and in Key Stage 1 and Reception, there's 35 minutes a week, um, increasing to 50 minutes in Year 3, 4, 5, and then Year 6 actually get an hour and 10 minutes a week of their language. Um, and I think without the increased pressure of maths and English and getting certain grades, etc., it does give more time for that subject specialism for the children to learn those languages and or in our case the language learning the becoming the linguist through the language um and and definitely there needs to be some thought about too much attention or no not attention because that's the wrong thing because actually maths and english do deserve the attention it's too much emphasis placed upon these SATS yeah. results and the league tables and Ofsted looking at these and then parents making judgments about which schools to send their children to based on whether they got the greater depth at year six or not. Absolutely. I think as well, you know, we need to be more creative about how we teach, say, English within other lessons. So just, you know, something that's come to my mind is I've, I've got a, a child in my year five class, one of my year five classes at the moment. And last year, um, when she was in year four, she came into one of my lessons. She didn't, she wasn't in school a huge amount. She had an awful lot of absence. And um, and even now, she, she can't really read very well at all. And she was taken out of music to go and do more reading with one of the... Um, the, the LSAs and she came into my lesson and she sort of threw herself down on the table and um, didn't really engage in my lessons at all and and I sort of went over to her the children were doing something and I said right what is the problem and she said it's not fair she just sat bolt upright right and looked at me and she said it's not fair she said I'm not allowed to go to music because I have to go and do extra reading with them um, with the TA and um, she said, and I love music. And she, she absolutely got me there. And I kind of, you know, sort of sat down with her and I said, you know what? I said, that isn't fair, is it? And she went, no, it's not. And I said, I'll tell you what, because we do a carousel of music, um, languages and PE. And I said, do you like PE? And she said, I do. She said, but I prefer music. And I said, OK. I said, if I can get you into the music lesson after my lesson, would you like to do that? And she went, yeah. And I said, look, it's not my decision. But if the music teacher and the PE teacher are happy, we'll we'll try and sort it out. So anyway, we did. And she went into that lesson. And um, one of the other LSAs in, in that year group was also in that lesson with her. And they were doing songwriting. And, um, and he said at the end of the lesson, he said, hers was the best. You know, a child who can't read, who can't write, who struggles with a lot of things in school. And um, anyway, so after the lesson, at the end of the morning, I went to find her, her teacher. And I said, look, I said, she has to be in, in her music lessons. Whatever happens, she has to be in music. I said, it's a no brainer. If she comes into school because music is her favorite lesson, that's where she needs to be. If you're going to take her out of music, she's not going to come into school on a Friday because she thinks that she's just got to do extra maths and English when actually all she wants to do is be in, in music. And, um, and, you know, she came up to me the following week and she sort of, she said to me, she said, thank you, miss, for what you did to me. She said, I love music. And she started singing to me and she's got a lovely, lovely voice. And actually I said to her, I said, what would have happened if Ed Sheeran hadn't been allowed to go to his music lessons? And, you know, we could, we, we could, if we were able to, you know, um, sort of teach English through 
songwriting in music or teach English through, um, I don't know, um, etymology in languages and, and things like that. And I think that's what we've got to do in order to really engage so many more children as well. And, and children like her, you know, I say to people all the time um, that, that, you know, if we're just giving them more and more of what they don't like, they feel they're not good at, and we're not allowing them to find their talents, be it music, be it art, be it drama, whatever it might be, then all we're doing is creating the next generation of neats because they're just going to turn around and say, well, I'm no good at anything, so I'm not going to bother trying at anything. I think you're right. And that's the contextualising the learning again. Once it was contextualised for that young girl, she was able to shine, wasn't she? And it's rather than, you know, this whole intervention with you know, you've got to your writing so that you can get this certain level by the end of year six. It's um, giving them these cold tasks to do. Why not find what their metier is and then get them to shine through that? That's really important, I think, giving them more opportunities to do things like that. Find their subject that they're so passionate about and get them to write in that subject about that subject. That's really important. And then learn why English and math is important in order for them to advance in that as well. Oh, I mean, just, Anna, that story, I had to really uh, take a moment there. I don't know about anybody else. I don't know if it's just a bit of a, an emotional Tuesday evening, but I had to, that, yeah, that I'm sure spoke to a lot of people. And I hope people listening and people who listen back to that hear that story. And of course, I mean, as I've said earlier on in the show, this, 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 I knew the show would go below, beyond talking about just languages and it has gone so much wider than that. And in coming away from, from this show this evening, it's, it's clear that not just from a, an MFL perspective, but from a curriculum perspective, and we talk about this a lot at the moment, it's a very hot topic. And certainly in a, in a post COVID world that this curriculum or these curriculums and I'm not just referring to the English curriculum here need looking at again they are not serving the children of today they're just they're just not it's 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 very apparent and we could go on and on and on about this and it could be a show in of itself and maybe it's something we need to to look at discussing in in more detail uh, uh, another time but it's it's painfully clear that you know we are that the world we're living in and the education that we're delivering, I mean, I said the education, the curriculums we're being forced to deliver or being shoved in our direction are not, are not right. And I just, um, excuse me, hiccuping partway through a sentence. I just uh, found a, a quote here that is, and I don't really want to rain on the parade of such a lovely story, but, um, and again, it does reference Brexit, but it's it's more than that. It says, in the post-Brexit climate has meant the issues of multilingualism and multiculturalism are now politically contentious. To speak another language is to be associated with an internationalist mindset, and the defense of language learning is charged with wider social issues beyond the scope of education policy, which we have absolutely spoken about in many different ways this evening. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of these things have to come from from the top, and well, the top at the moment, um, I know that there are people at Teachers Talk Radio and Beyond that have um, uh, opinions on and very detailed thoughts on. But uh, it's it's an ongoing journey. And I know that there are people like uh, you, Anna, you, Alex and Lisa, who was on earlier, who are, as I think Lisa put it, fighting the, the good fight and absolutely working very hard in their in their corners of the world. And, and I know that there are more of you out there in whatever subject you are teaching or whatever area of education you are in who really are trying to do the good works from the inside despite the fact that from up above it is uh I don't even know how to put that tactfully so I'm not going to try but um it has been um a very a very very interesting evening and I'm conscious that we're getting close to nine o'clock so I'm just going to for the final time mention our delightful sponsor happy confident company who are a well i suppose they are um all about mental health they're all about well-being and for 10 minutes a day if you want to just take a moment with your with your classes to address 
some, you know, some mindfulness and some well-being, then you can do that with the resources Happy Confident Company provide. And if you would like to know more, you can go to www.happyconfident.com. So all that remains for me to say this evening, even though I feel I could talk to you uh, for hours, both you, Alex, and you, Anna, and Lisa, who has gone off to hopefully have a lovely dinner with her husband. But um, many, many learnings this evening, many, many different things talked about. But uh, I think the, the um, I just want uh, both of you in as quickly as you can to summarize sort of your, well, your thoughts and feelings on this evening's conversation and just... Uh, what you hope to see going forward with uh, language teaching and language learning. So, uh, Anna, you're up first. No pressure. Oh, my goodness. Um, That's really hard. Um, Okay, what's just popped into my mind is um, a presentation that I've got on my laptop um, and it finishes with a report card and it says, could do better. (laughs) Um, And I think that probably summarises where I feel we are um and yeah I'm just going to continue my shouting and my campaigning to try to change things because I just think that our young people of today deserve better oh definitely and uh, I hope that um more people uh follow you on twitter and certainly uh have chats with you and I uh, I have absolutely loved talking to you thank you so I really do appreciate your yeah your thoughts and your your insights this evening and Alex, to to round us out, uh, what are your well takeaways, and what do you what do you hope to see going forward? So my, I mean, my takeaways. I've just I've really enjoyed this evening. This is the first time that I've taken part um, in one of these, um, and it's been really interesting to bounce ideas around and to to hear the different experiences of other people. I think moving forwards for language learning in our schools, we need to be empowering our teachers. We need to be giving them the resources, giving them the time to be able to teach these wonderful, beautiful languages that are learned across our schools. And I think the big thing is um, utilising technology and what we can use, do with that te- technology to empower those teachers to to teach the children and for the children to be able to use to demonstrate their learning. That's like the biggest thing. And I think technology is so useful in language learning um so yeah that's that's my thoughts brilliant well thank you again so much to the the two of you for being here it's been an absolute pleasure and please do come back uh, either to chat to me or to any of the other hosts on teachers talk radio you are both absolutely welcome back at at any point it has been an absolute joy um i have misplaced my list of shows that are swirling around my mind at the moment i can't remember if i've um, concluded my primary subjects or if i've still got more to go i think i have been uh, i have been adding to adding to the list but there's also other things that are on my mind as well that if i don't write down i never end up talking it about it might be worth as well just saying Catherine's on now so if anyone wants oh. to listen to that um she's on right now live on the tt radio website just click listen live to listen to Catherine taylor What's she talking about, Rod? She is talking about ITT experiences. So teacher oh, training experiences. Yeah. Fabulous. Cool. Okay. And that's over on the TTR website. Well, that is definitely my cue to love and leave you all. Have a great rest of the week and I will talk to you soon. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.